Here we go with another banger, people. Hey, this man is hard to catch because he's moving so fast. You know, he like a shooting star. We're trying to catch him on the way up. You know, in fact, I might be hanging on to his damn coattails. We got uh, Mr. Justin Gandy in the house. Going to drop some gems, bear his soul, and let us know that it, there is no secret sauce. You got to get out here and get it. What's up, Justin? Welcome to Tech the Titan. I'm phenomenal, how you, man. How you doing, Miss Ward? Too blessed to be stressed, man. I'm honored you asked me, honestly. I've been looking forward to this the last couple of days since we talked about it. <laughs> well, man, I appreciate you being here. So we're going to get it rocking and rolling. Why don't you tell the people a little about, bit about yourself? Let's start out with, uh, let's just start out with the question that everybody wants to know. Why appliance repair? Why appliance repair? So I'm actually third generation doing this. And, uh, there's literally close to 50 people in my family that have made this their career path. So from an early age, I'm talking 11, 12 years old, I was out running service calls with my dad. My uncles were working for him at the time. So it became a huge family deal. And, you know, I got to see uh, a lot of these uh you know, members of my family succeed in the industry and I'd watch their, their, their sales approach and how they'd work with customers. And it just rubbed off on me. And, uh, you know, I actually left the industry for about seven years. I, I, uh, became a licensed investment banker, worked for, um, the, the department of defense. Um, and what brought me back to it is I missed the purpose of it. I missed, um, you know, training technicians. Banking was a very self-fulfilling job. I made a lot of money, but I didn't have any purpose. And it, when that's missing uh, in your career, it doesn't matter how much money you make, uh, you know, sitting in a cubicle 12 hours a day was never going to make me happy. So yeah, that's def awesome. definitely, definitely making an impact on young men and women and really just trying to see where I can take this thing. All right. Well, let's ask a couple of questions because, you know, I really want to flesh this out for people because when they hear that you're third generation, you know, a lot of times they think you're born with a silver spoon in, in your mouth and they don't understand that this is a trade that is truly a trade. You mm -hmm. follow me that, you know, your family had to learn it. You know, you're bringing in modern technology, you're scaling, you're bringing your background and in investment, but you're bringing tools to the table that really are pumping it up. So talk to us about the very early days when you were a young, young man, when you were, you know, basically a baby. I'm sure you saw your parents struggle and things like that. Oh yeah. I remember when my dad started his company, they couldn't afford a hose to fill their water bed. Um, you know, now they're buying a house in Hilton Head, uh, living in a $2 million house. And they're actually my biggest competitor. You know, they're on their, their, at the tail end of their careers and about to retire. And, and, you know, it just so happened that I already had my family here in Kansas city and I asked their blessing if I could start a business in the same Metro. And here we are five years later and uh, you know, I'm their biggest competitor, but you know, the, there's no doubt uh, the early years of this career, it's a, it's a pride swallowing siege, right? Because you, you, you learn real quick. The only path to growth in this industry is failure. Um, you know, the more failures, the more you learn. And, you know, when, when I got into it, my dad's business wasn't established. So I was out and on, on an Island at 18, 19 years old. And I look like a baby. I mean, these people were like, we want the experienced guy. We don't want this kid out here. Not to mention I got a disability. So it's like, you mix the, all that together and it's like the customer has no faith in me. And I realize I got to overcome this by how I present myself, how, how, you know, talk about the knowledge and the background in my family. And, um, you know, I can't imagine starting in this career now because of the technology changes. It's just a whole nother animal. And, uh, my heart goes out to some of these guys coming in the industry. And that's why I really make an attempt to try to give any advice I can, because it's, it really is a whole different animal, but it's also job security because of it. Right. Um, 
So yeah, that definitely, I mean, watching my dad work 16 hour days, just trying to grind to get to the point where he can hire one and two guys. And it was really the best experience that I could have witnessed that, look, he would take two steps forward and then a guy would get fired or quit and he'd take a step back and he just kept getting back on the horse. And I was like, you know, at 20 years old, I'm like, he's insane. Like who would do this knowing that they just fail over and over and over again. And I didn't realize he had such a big picture thing that he was like, you know, this is all going to pay off five, 10 years from now. And I got to say, man, he, you know, a kid like him growing up in Chicago, uh, in the projects to live in the life he lives now it's it's a testament to the american dream i mean without a doubt so i understand it man i love it i love it you know i love how you pay homage because you know when we're growing up you know you you know parenting doesn't come with a rule book you know what i mean and i'm sure there were times when he left that house he didn't want to leave because there were issues that needed him yeah. but you know you know, a lot of people don't understand in business, there are choices you got to make for 10 years from now that you don't want to make in this moment, you know? And that's the difference between the people who win and lose is that a lot of times I don't think people understand how much you put on the line because, you know, one of my biggest complaints is when people come in the industry and think it's a quick lick, Right. Like they get a couple of jobs, knock out, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten jobs, no recalls, no issues. And they really ain't fixing. A lot of them just patching or they pattern recognition. Then when they get stuck and they pants down, they want to call you to help them out. But they never did the work. They ain't got no blood, no sweat and no tears in the game. So when you're hiring technicians or when people approach you, because I'm sure you're getting it. You know, you get the guy that say they know everything that come to you for a job. And then you find out they got bad habits and know nothing. And then you got the kid that got hard. But then you're going to have to step back and train them. So how do you deal with both those scenarios, the kid or the even the older person that want to get in the industry? But they yeah. don't study so much. They think it's one thing, but they don't realize you really got to get technical. Like I agree with uh, what uh, David O said the other day. Appliance repair is the hardest of all the trades because we have to know them all. I I couldn't agree more. When he said that statement, I, I was literally shaking my head up and down while I was watching. You know, um, I'm, I'm going to just be blunt. I don't hire people with experience. I've been down that road uh, too many times and not a single one of them are, are still working for me today. You know, and the thing is, I'll hire an older guy, I'll hire a younger guy. I don't care about uh, age or anything like that. What I'm looking for is some, I love second chance guys, okay? I got a, for, I got a former gangbanger that was shot when he was 17 that turned his life around that works for me. Just bought his first house, has a wife and a daughter. I mean, and he's, he's a stud. I got another guy that's like that, very humble be be beginnings. And, uh, you know, for myself growing up in that environment, I'm looking for those grinder mentality. Like you have the will to succeed. You have the work ethic, but you just haven't opened the right door yet. Right. So that's definitely a trait that I look for. And then the other thing is I make it a point when I first hire somebody to have them ride with me for a while so they get to know what I'm really about that I'm not just about the money. This is about me helping you learn a career path and hopefully being a great addition to our team so we can all get to the same goal. And I'm very transparent about where our business is heading from day one, what what that means for you if you apply yourself and, and make the sacrifices necessary to do so. And uh, I think that's one of the most important things I've learned as a leader in the last two years as the business has really exploded is you really got to always be in touch and communicate with your staff to say, Hey, this is where we're at. This is where we're heading. And this is what it all means for you individually. Right. Um, and that takes a while to kind of find that groove. I think you probably can relate. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now you're, you're talking about a very delicate subject there because, you know, not, a, not everybody has what I call discernment. 
when it comes to hiring people with those checkered past. Mm -hmm. You feel me? And knowing who yeah. to hire, who to believe in. And, you know, because they checking you out, you checking them out. So um, how do you really know? You, you know what I'm saying? Because I've seen guys who look like you that hire these guys and they get ran over. Let's just sure. keep it a buck. Sure. <laughs> and well, I'm sure you've had conversations with people who got ran over. And it wasn't necessary just to check a pass people, just people with, you know, were manipulating to interview well, but, you know, showed up and didn't do well. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll say this, and I, I, I don't know if you can relate or not, but I'll say this, you know, growing up in the environment I, I grew up in, I'm a wolf too, right? At heart, I got that in me, but I've grown as a man and found my moral compass of what is important to me and how I should, how I should act right in the world, so to speak. So I purposely kind of give these guys opportunities early on. And I want to see, are you going to, are you going to take advantage of the situation? Are you going to try to keep asking for more? Or are you going to humble yourself and realize that I'm the guy that's going to help you get there? Right. And uh, for instance, like, I, I just brought a guy back on that um, had some driving stuff multiple, multiple times and had to do a little bit of time. And now he's got his life together. And uh, I said to him, look, I'm going to help you buy a vehicle. Um, you know, why don't you go on Facebook Marketplace and, and take a peek and give me some options of what you're thinking? If he tries to send me over $30,000 trucks, I'm going to kind of take a step back and go, come on, is that? Is that really what you expect, right? So I'm always kind of trying to gauge somebody and, and mm -hmm. find out where their moral compass is, right? Exactly. You're never you're never always going to hit uh, 100%, uh, but I'm sure you can say this as well, Ms. Ward. As, as leaders in, in our company, you hire and train this many people nonstop for years and years. Your intuition with people dramatically intensifies where little things become big things you know and it's not always what people say or it's it's more about like how they interact with other staff are they trying to be somebody helpful and be part of the team or are they trying to throw one of the other guys under the bus so they can move up the the, the pecking order right mm -hmm. and uh you find out real early um you know because our average guys train in somewhere between four to six months and within four to six months, if you know, a couple months, if I start to see red flags, I don't hesitate anymore. I pull the bandaid off. I don't try to, you know, fix something that I know is going to be a problem down the road um, and address it right away, you know? So that's it's probably one of the biggest challenges we face in our industry, wouldn't you think? I, mean, I agree. Yeah. I agree. You know, I, I agree that that's a huge uh, challenge. You know, I what I you know, my dream is really to see all of us come together at some point and create like a major training uh, facility nationwide. And, you know, one centrally located in an area where you can get grind guys out, you know, try and get, get them right out of high school or out of the military, because people are always in transition. And most people are looking for a home. They really are. Uh, they get a good, you know, give them a good skill set, kind of like a job core for adults, if necessary. But, you know, a prime example, you know, people talk about job core, but job core has great appliance repair would be a great program to put in job core. You Absolutely. know, they, I'm telling you, they got construction, they got other stuff. And, you know, a lot of people don't know that job core was actually the brainchild of Alpha Kappa Alpha, which is a, 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 a female uh, African-American uh, uh, sorority. Uh, right. It's actually the original one. And is they that... actually created job core. And most people don't know that. They created that... the legislature in that program. So at the end of the day, you know, this is why I always tell people, you got to look behind the, look behind the curtain. You'd be surprised who's standing there. So it would be a great thing, particularly with the desperation that's out here in the market 
And there's so many uh, workforce that's needed. Like right now, I'm in, in talks with workforce here in Florida, developing a program, things of that nature. But, you know, a lot of stuff, I just keep my mouth shut. Because yeah. when you're moving at a certain level and it ain't about you, you know, you want to make sure that you, you know, run that program or that situation where you are. So before you roll it out nationally, all the kinks out. You know, Absolutely. but there, all the trades and the reality is, in my opinion, and I don't know how you feel about this, you know, we are really moving toward home service period where you're going to have to be able to go in the house and do a little bit of plumbing, a little bit of this, a little, you know, change the I, light I, switch. I couldn't agree more. Uh, as my company's grown, we're adding more and more services because my father-in-law who worked in computers for years and years, he was a VP of one of the largest companies in the world. He, he told me from the very beginning, he's like, don't pigeonhole yourself. He goes, you never know what can happen technology wise. He goes, when you get to a point where you've built that foundation, you better keep expanding and always be pivoting uh, to where, you know, if you look at any of the big, big successful businesses, none of them just do one thing, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we want them to call us for plumbing issues, for HVAC, commercial appliances, whatever it may be. Uh, but I will touch back on what you just asked me about just real quick. So the other thing that I look for in guys like that is how they treat treat the office staff, specifically the women in my office staff. It's You can find a lot about a man by how he treats women in the workplace, for real. Um, and it really, and they give me good feedback, right? The, the women in my office, they've, they've got to the point where they can really gauge Who's the good, good apples and bad apples, so to speak? That's awesome. So, how do you keep the? <laughs> this seems to be an issue because I've I've been running into this lately. How do you keep the staff off the staff? Because I've been running into in issues. I don't have them in my life, but sure. some other uh, guys I know who have staff. A lot of their uh, office staff may have situations with some of the techs which can be touchy you mm -hmm. know what i mean have you ever had to deal with that situation where they have relationships and it might spill over into work or yes so i say this i don't have any of those issues and i think a big reason why i don't and i did at one point uh my office manager previously that we ended up firing we brought in this new lady i brought i made it clear from every tech we hired from day one that she is an extension of me. And if you cross that line with her, it's like crossing the line with me. She does not work for you. She is not your, your office mate. She does not clean up your, your messes. And if you treat her that way, you're going to hear from me. And, and they've embraced her, right? So like mm -hmm. a lot of these guys are very protective of her because she's become like our den mother, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, but I, I definitely see how it can be an issue with, you know, especially um, younger office staff. I think part of the reason I don't so much is she's more of their mom's age or even close to mm -hmm. grandmother's age where there's a mm -hmm. certain mm -hmm. unspoken respect. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just been I'm chuckling about it because. I've just been talking to a couple of guys and they've had that issue. And it, it reminds me of my life when I was in uh, automotive and dealing with that. And I had, boy, I would have some situations. But um, moving on, um, as far as these people that, you know, the people who are entering the in industry and who have decided not to go work for someone and get training, but start on their own. From the initial onset, what is your recommending of how they structure the one man, you know, the one man business, particularly if they're, because, you know, you got a lot of them out here, they're learning while they're trying to run a business, which is a lot harder than most people understand. Absolutely. And, you know, my, my, my number one suggestion to any of these guys, because I get approached by them quite often, is start with property managers directly and limit the amount of COD exposure you have. Because with property managers, you got a little bit of buffer with the tenant and your actual client, which is the property manager. So if, you're, if you make a mistake diagnosing wise or something comes up, 
you've got an opportunity to write that shit before the property manager uh, finds out about it and you're exposed, right? Um, not to mention there are more basic appliances typically. Um, and it gives you a chance to kind of build on the foundation of what you're trying to do instead of go try to go after these COD clients that the second that it goes wrong, you you better either give the money back or you better find a solution because, you know, that's the reality. I mean, yeah, yeah. They pay a lot of money for the product and you better not scratch the floor up. You better have the insurance in place. You better have all your ducks in a row. And I think, I think property managers, you know, there's no cost per acquisition of customer. It is, it is a little bit of stress because you do have to weed out some of the good and bad ones, but it's a way to keep your costs down and overhead while you get your feet under you. And as you're growing your business, you can use that as stability. So if you bring somebody on, you put them on property managers and then you go try to get more COD business. So it's a great transitional point, I think, uh, directly. Right. So how do you think they should gauge their abilities? You know, um, because this the thing, this is my whole issue with people who go out here on the Lone Ranger is that yeah. a lot of them don't develop relationships or have a round table. And if they try to develop relationships, they come to you wrong. Like they come to me wrong all the time, but you know, I'd be like, talk to the hand because the face don't understand because I'm going to hurt your feelings. And, you know, I, I feel sorry for them, but at the same time, I understand that you got to get it out the mud. And Absolutely. they don't, un a lot, of, I just think people don't understand what we, the price we pay to get where we are and stay where we are and continue to elevate. You know, I, I had a guy ask me recently to give him a copy of how I write up my work orders for and my invoices. And I said, no, the last time I did that, they ended up in the wrong hands. Because I provided them with somebody in confidence because I'm very detailed and I got the code. I cracked the code. Now, if Justin asked me, that's a different conversation. We're we're colleagues and we're on the same tier he understands the unspoken word you know what Absolutely. i mean so as and soon he, as they, they get and, caught up they're gonna throw you under the bus exactly and it ain't happening not over here so yeah. um how should they gauge their abilities or like you look at me i go out when i'm in augusta because i cover four states i'll be seeing your daddy and i'm up there in hilton head because i cover hilton in fact i was there this weekend um and I always go and see, when I'm in Augusta, I go hang out with Phil, go get some additional training with him, you know, always rack, pulling his brain, picking. But I have, there. these are roundtable people. Yeah. You, EJ, you guys are like people that I know, like if I know if I pick up the phone and need to talk to Justin, Justin's going to get with me. You feel me? But it's a mutual respect. So Absolutely. how do you get, I mean, what do we tell these people who don't understand this ain't what you think? Well, you know, the, the thing is, is it, anybody can learn how to fix a dryer, right? The, the thing that I think newer people that go out on their own completely undervalue is the amount of sacrifice it takes to keep it going, not to get it there, right? Anybody can make an appliance repair business successful for a short period of time. What they don't realize is, with limited experience, you're gonna no matter you have very limited field knowledge, so you're you're gonna get recalls, you're gonna get complaints, and how you deal with those complaints sets the tone for how you deal with your business from that point forward. So my suggestion to them first off is be very strategic who you associate yourself with and take advice from. Do not go on these Facebook groups and take these comments at face value. A lot of these guys have been in the industry a long time. They're a little soured sometimes, right? And their their entire mentality has, has got a negative context to it. You as a business owner working for yourself and trying to build your own business, you should be absolutely ecstatic that you have business. And it, regardless if it goes good or bad, you got to do the right thing from day one because it's going to become a behavioral thing with you. 
to whether you deal with your customers in a positive manner and you avoid those bad reviews and all, all these complaints, or you say, screw you, move on to the next one. You can only burn through the city one time, right? I don't think many people should go out on their own without some experience or at least a guardian angel, so to speak, helping them along the way because the exposure that you don't realize you're exposing yourself to is legally, you're sacrificing your family, how you interact with your family. Shit, I've been doing this 20 years and I have to purposely, intentfully uh, make time for my family and make sure that I can handle it all. And I've been doing this 20 years. This shit is easy for me at this point, right? Technically it is, but it's all the other things, right? And keeping that image and reputation intact to me is the only, only thing at, at, um, at stake. That's the only thing that I ever cared about when I was first growing my business. The money I knew was a five, 10 year out the door deal from the get go it was my reputation is the only thing that is valuable here. And how do I keep that intact? And that's hard to explain to somebody who's got six months to a year experience because all they're seeing is dollars and cents right out the door from day one. They don't realize that's all going to get churned right back into your business the first five years. It, even if you are successful, right? Um, you, the hope is that seven, eight, nine, ten 10 year mark, your overhead starts dropping because you're getting repeat business. You're getting a list of vendors built up. And that's when you start to get the, the profit swing to where future earning potential for doing all these sacrifices is going to pay dividends 5, 10x. But most people want it too quickly, too quickly. And they, you can't take away from your business that early. I agree. You know, I, I look at my own business and I feel like I would have been farther quicker if I didn't try to help so many people or bring people with me. And um, and it's unfortunate, but it's an experience I needed to have. So now when I navigate, all my stuff is extremely strategic. I only have reciprocating relationships personally and professionally. And I make sure that when I'm bringing things to the table, such as interviewing you, I want to make sure I'm asking insightful, but also respectful questions. So with that said, let's talk about that uh, balancing family piece, because I heard you talk about your father-in-law. And then my, the first thing I was thinking to myself, I said, oh, this young man learned how to marry up points. <laughs> and that's another thing that goes back to association. So how much has your partnership with your wife, her understanding and her keeping you from jumping off a bridge? How much has that helped you in your business and your growth in the business? So transparently, I've done this twice before and uh, I didn't have my wife uh, at the time in my corner. And both of those businesses never even got close to hiring one person. And now we're employing close to 20. Um, she is, she is the backbone, you know, behind every good man is a great woman. Uh, the, the, I hate to say it cause it's corny, but it's true. Uh, she supports me even when she doesn't agree sometimes. And the sacrifices she's made has made it to where our business could flourish because she saw what was going into it. Right. And then you take into account, you know, her father, her, her dad is my hero. Uh, yeah, he's, he's had a, a huge impact in, in our success in both personal and business. Um, you know, he's always there for me. Uh, when I need to talk about the business, regardless if it's good or bad. And he's not afraid to pull punches and, and tell me how it really is. He, he tells me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. And having somebody that you respect and trust so much in your corner to say, hey, man, you might want to check yourself. It's getting a little out, out of hand in this area, or I'm just noticing some things. Learning to accept that criticism uh, 
is the biggest thing I've learned as I've gotten. He's not doing it to hurt me. He's doing it because he, he sees potential in me and just wants to help me. So having somebody like that is huge. That, that. That's, awesome. That's awesome, man. That's a blessing, you know, and the, the fact that as a man, you recognize that, you know, the honor that and respect that you give your wife and her family. And then just that mono to mono, that man to man thing you have with your, your father-in-law, you know, people would kill for that. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Because it is priceless. It really is. So make sure you tell them I said hello, both of them. You know, and, you know and, and the thing about it is, is that the beautiful thing about this, this is something you you are able to pay forward to the people you come in contact from the young men and, and women that you work with. And just even the, I mean, I'm sure you walked into the situations that, in customers' homes and, you know maybe been able to leave a word or something for someone that, that will have, that's having struggles because it's a lot of people out here struggling, man. Yeah. And that's real. So it's, that's, that's so wonderful to hear. So let's talk about uh, the future. Mm -hmm. What do you see for your appliance repair company at this point in the next years or so? So ideally if I could have my way and I had a crystal ball, um, you know, I've already started that path by buying that appliance business in Oklahoma city and giving my, my top two guys ownership stake in that. I want to have satellite offices in seven to 10 States where the people that are helping me build this business in Kansas city, I can, I can give back to them what they've put into this business. There would, there's nothing that would make me happier than to put them in a position where they don't have to put the capital on the line, build the brand, right? And I can guide them through what we have to do to, to grow it and, and um, you know, be, be in all, all over the country. I mean, if we're if we're being honest, I'm going for the moon, Miss Warden. I really am. I figure if I get halfway there, I'm still going to be very successful. So why not? Why not just go for it? You know what I mean? Um, and I have I have some good people that really have ambition and the skill set to be able to do this on their own. And with time, there's no reason they can't. And to be honest with you, I did it as a way to combat people leaving my organization, right? That wanted to find out, do they have what it takes to run their own? And, and I figured this is the best way to combat it is I'll expand, right? And we'll find some established small mom and pop businesses where a guy's maybe hitting retirement age. We can buy it at a reasonable price and we can build that brand and do all the things that we've done to, to really have some explosive growth. And do it to where I'm still got some skin in the game. These guys got some skin in the game. And at the end of the day, I can walk away with my head up, head out high. And nobody's, you know, going to be left out. Um, that, that would be, that would be the ideal situation. That's awesome, man. Just remember that. Make sure you call me when the hedge funds come knocking. Because you know that world. And you yep. know that they are gobbling up a lot of serve of the service industry because they understand the profit. You know what I mean? And 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 man, that's that's next level. I'm so proud of you. And I I love it when I see people who actually aren't afraid to go out and get it because it, I mean it's out there. I'm proud yep. of you, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate man, I'm, it. I'm proud of it. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the expansion and let's talk about uh you know, because I'm coaching someone right now who just purchased an appliance repair business. And mm -hmm. it has been quite interesting, okay? From the beginning to him actually taking full ownership. And uh, this person came in without any experience at all in the industry. And it's a whole situation. Because you know, you know, I love your girl. What's our girl, Cody Sanchez? Mrs. Contrarian Thought? Yeah, these folks out here believe in the they believe in the hype. So hey, I'm here for it. So yeah. let's talk about that because you know 
being able to be smart enough to source a company, because there's a lot of them up for sale out here, but being able to source it, vet vet the client, vet the situation, make sure it's a win-win for yourself and the other investors and other people involved. How did that, uh, how did you get to that point? So um, I I took a lot of the, the skills that I learned in investment banking and applied it towards uh, looking and evaluating the, the businesses that I was approaching, right? First and foremost, what area are we servicing? What is the competition like in that area? And what's the potential growth in that market without spending a million dollars to get there, right? Um, the most important thing that I've learned that is valuable that me and my wife from the get go have kind of, we paid the piper by doing a lot of the marketing stuff and website stuff ourselves. So we could always have our hand and pulse on the business to where if it needed a little bit of a bump, we could, we could instantly do that uh, by doing the marketing stuff ourselves, you know, but more than anything, the only thing that I was looking at is reputation SEO ranking factors, where are they at after 15 years? Are they ranking number one? Um, you know, the guy that I bought the business from, he hadn't advertised on Google uh, monetarily in almost seven years. He had three people working for him and was consistently keeping enough work for those three people without spending one dollar in advertising. And when I when I saw those numbers and he was making it profitable. And just keeping it small, I realized this is a gold mine. He's kept it lean. He's not overreached. He doesn't, he's not leaning on uh, lead generation. He did it organically and built those reviews and that online presence to where it's feeding itself now. Um, that's the biggest probably. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, I love that approach and I love you being able to take that skill set. And um, I think that's very important that people understand the importance of transferable skills. You know, a lot of people want to come in the industry and, you know, I watch a couple of people that, you know, talk about the numbers, this and that. But to be able to be a Swiss Army knife and be able to repair, be able to guide technicians technically, manage the business, the profit in and all that, and P&L and understand the KPI reports and things of that nature, that's large. And um, I commend you because this, this is the difference when you're talking to somebody that want to be a business owner and somebody not only is a business owner, but structures, structures the business for growth and scalability. See, the conversation we have is that scalability game. Absolutely. So let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I will say this. I see I see a lot of guys that fall in love with the processes, right? And they, 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 they put all that structure in place, which is a, a great thing. And it's a, it's a must thing as you're scaling your business. But the most important thing, in my opinion, is being a grinder yourself. You you got to constantly go. You can't let your foot off the gas as soon as you get some success and then turn into playing the business owner role. Because, you know, I've told guys before, when you, you're going to face challenges and when you do financially and there's going to be dips in those times, the only way to fix it and the best way to fix it is to get your ass back in the truck and go to work. And, and you can make up for that because you're making 100%. I see it over and over and over again where guys start, he'll, he'll get like three or four guys working for him. And then he goes, I'm just going to let him have all the calls. The problem is, is that your 100% is what funds the growth of the business so that you can withstand all the things that go wrong and hit that buffer and still keep going forward. The second you sit, take yourself out of a truck, now you've just pigeonholed yourself and now you're trying to figure out where do I save money on my margins, keep my costs down. You're not at the point where you should be keeping costs down. You're at the point where you should be trying to drive growth day in and day out, right? So don't play that business on a roll as soon as you start having some success. 
you know, the great thing about our industry is you will transparently get out of it what you put into it. The problem is, is don't take that as fool's gold. When those checks start rolling in, you better save for a rainy day. Because as you try to grow, you got 10 people on staff, that payroll week's 15 grand a week now. You got a couple bad weeks and it can get out of control real fast, right? And, uh, you know, I had to learn it the hard way. And there were times where I was out running 10, 12 calls a day, seven days a week to make up for those mistakes. Where I took my foot off the gas and lost sight of it and <laughs> fell in love with my ego and all the people stroking my my ego saying, man, you're doing so good. It's like, man, what, what am I still doing in the truck? Shit, I'm still in a truck right now and I'm in two cities. Because taking yourself out of the equation is is an absolute mistake, not only from a financial standpoint, but I believe culturally, as you're growing technicians and training people, there's a certain amount of respect that comes with you doing the job side by side. And it's culturally, it, it ingrains something differently than you just being a guy that just signs the checks and sits in the office. That's true. I agree. Well, you know, at the end of the day, um, and we're going to wrap this up because I'm going to let you get back to that pretty lady and that wonderful life. I'm not going to affect the balance. I have so much more. I'm sure we're going to be having many more conversations in the uh, future. But um, what would you recommend as far as people preparing for the future? That one man, that one man truck. How do they compete and and dominate in that little niche in the world? Because you know the riches is in the niches. How yeah. how would you recommend they arm the you know they arm themselves so that they can be profitable and growing in twenty twenty four? So looking at it from a market trend standpoint, um, just like I did in banking, right? we're starting to see certain things manufacturing wise that is letting us know where this industry is heading in my opinion. And in my opinion, the future of this industry is in refrigeration. Yeah. Um, I'm muted. Did you get muted? Let me see if I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yep. No okay. problem. Sorry about that. Hey, so, hey, 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 that's that's spy net. They own to us, man. We got to hurry up. They're like, absolutely. don't tell the secrets. Go ahead, man. Yeah, no kidding. They probably got a satellite looking on me or something. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> so what I was getting at was, you know, if you look at the market trends, okay, we're seeing back when I started doing this 20 years ago, my dad had 17 guys on staff. We had one sealed system tech. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I have, what, 16, 15, 16 guys, and we have seven sealed system techs. The rate of compressor failure is way higher. In my opinion, they're doing it on purpose by design. They, they want these products only to last a certain amount of time. Um, and they're, you know, with, with the technological changes, there's things they're doing on purpose that ensures that they don't last 20 years anymore. Um, I do think that high-end appliances is definitely the way to go. And I, I really think as a way forward for my company, I'm going to dip more and more of my hand in commercial um, because I think we're going to reach a point where dishwashers are nothing more than a throwaway, um, just like microwaves. I mean, back when I started this, we worked on microwaves constantly. Right. Um, but I do think that refrigerators and front load laundry centers, what, however, it ends up transitioning into one product or one unit, those those dollars are going to get bigger. Uh, these appliance manufacturers are not going to keep lowering the cost with certain products. But the ones that are the big ticket item that everybody wants, those are going to get more and more expensive. And I, I really feel if you're not doing sealed system or trying to find a path to get there, you're really going to hamstring yourself in five, 10 years. 
um, because so much of the work when it comes to refrigerators, which is how you, you know, I say this to people all the time. You don't, you don't earn a customer for life by fixing a dishwasher. You earn a customer for, for life by saving somebody's groceries. Right. Um, so in my opinion, I, I really think high end refrigerators, uh, refrigerators in general, but also expanding into commercial. I mean, commercial products are how they build them 20 years ago. They have very few computer boards. They're very basic technology wise. The thing that I found out now that I've really dipped my feet into commercial is you also are in a situation where these people can't wait to decide whether or not to fix it. They got to fix it right then. So the leverage of uh, trying to get a better price and this and that, it doesn't exist in commercial. They just want to know, can you fix it today? Because I'm losing out on money. My business cannot work without this. And that's where I'm transitioning my business is more towards commercial appliances and HVAC long term. Outstanding. So if someone wants to do that, any recommendations as far as training on the commercial side or HVAC? Well, you know, in it, so I'm on the board at the trade school locally here in Kansas City. I'm involved quite a bit. Um, I actually have already reached out to the professor at the trade school in Oklahoma City. Those trade schools are really getting to know those professors on a first name basis. These guys have made a career teaching students in commercial products and in all of it to where, you know, they know a lot that we don't even know to where it's nice to be able to call that guy and say, hey, you, have you seen this before? Or is this something you're teaching in your course? Or maybe you should be, right? Um, I really think that your local trade schools and, and getting on a first name basis with those professors directly and say, look, I'm interested in growing my business and scaling. I'd love to use your school as a great pathway for that. And understanding as business owners out here, okay, these, these trade schools get federal and state funding based on retention rates. The longer that students are in the industry, the more funding these schools get from it. So if you're providing good quality jobs, that's all you need to offer to them. And they are more than happy to extend the olive branch and help you in any way they can. Uh, there's not anything you got to do besides that, except they know this is a great place to send my students so that we can keep retention rates higher and I can keep my job and, and we can exp expand our budgets. Outstanding. Well, thank you so much for providing all this insight, all this wisdom. I'm going to hand you back to all those people that love you over there. But thank you again for stepping away and taking some time for with me and my viewers. We greatly appreciate it, Mr. Gandhi. And I want you to enjoy the rest of your evening, man. I, I appreciate it. And I'll say this, Ms. Ward, someone needs to do one on you sometime <laughs> to sit and ask you questions because because I'm sure there's a bunch in there. I'd love to turn the tables on you one time. And, and, hey, and man. You, hey, man, whenever you want to do it, we're going to do it like Andy Frazilla did it. And they had his wife was on there asking him questions along with his sidekick about 75 Heart. Great podcast. So we'll definitely uh, make sure that happens. But once again, any last words for the people before we sign off, sir? I'll just have a great Christmas and happy new year. And, and uh, you know, balance that, that, uh, that family and business life. Definitely. All right, man.